And we turn to a discussion of the causes, strengths, and weaknesses of the growing public protest in the U.S. and abroad. For that, we're joined by Sarah Van Gelder, executive editor of Yes! Magazine, a publication focusing on social justice, economics, and environmental issues. Josh Barrow is a fellow at the conservative-leaning Manhattan Institute and historian Beverly Gage of Yale University. She's author of The Day Wall Street Exploded, a look at a bombing on Wall Street in 1920. Sarah Van Gelder, start with you. What do you think is going on here? What, what are these protests tapping into? Well, I think they've managed to name the, the essence of what's going on for the 99% right now. For the last couple of decades, middle class and poor people have seen wages stagnate. At first, we were able to make up for it by working multiple jobs, by both mom and pop in the family working, by working longer hours. And then we were able to make up for the stagnating wages by going deeper into debt, borrowing against the value of our house. But with the 2008 collapse, we couldn't do that anymore. And we started really feeling the pain of losing jobs, losing our homes in many cases, losing access to health care. And I think at first a lot of Americans really helped, hoped that the Washington establishment would come up with solutions. And that hasn't happened, especially this summer. We saw how much gridlock there was in Washington. And I think people finally got fed up and decided they needed to take to the streets and speak for themselves. Josh Barrow, people fed up, a sense that the system isn't working for them. What do you see and why now? Well, I think a lot of people are very upset because we've been through three years of terrible economic performance. I actually think it reflects a lot of the same discontent that drove the Tea Party starting in 2009. Um, but the left's reaction was delayed for a couple of years because I think there was hope that the Obama administration uh, would provide them the solutions they were looking for, and that hope has not panned out. Um, but while I think that the protests reflect a great deal of, of discontent and especially uh, upset with the uh, financial sector and with uh, people at the top of the income distribution, what we're not seeing out of these protests that we did see out of the Tea Party is an alternative policy agenda. Uh, we're seeing a lot, a lot of complaint and, and a lot of agitation, but what we're not seeing are proposals about what the government should do to placate these people or to make people's lives better. Well, Beverly Gage, I'll bring you in here. You've looked at past protests against Wall Street. Uh, what, what, compare that. What do you see going on now and, and uh, what uh, Josh Barrow just said about the amorphous nature of this? I think that the big question of this financial crisis up to this point has actually been why we haven't seen more of this kind of protest. Um, in past financial crises, looking back to the 1890s, for instance, or looking at the Great Depression, you actually had a great deal of social unrest that up to this point we really haven't seen. Um, so now that it's beginning to start and beginning to build, I do think that what we're beginning to see is fairly typical of a movement that's just emerging. It's a movement that's really about calling questions right now and as it moves into other stages we may see other things develop but right now it's about posing this kind of question and I think that that's really the role that a lot of social movements of this sort have played from the populists of the late 19th century through the kind of social unrest that we saw during the depression and now once again today. Well, Sarah Van Gelder, what do you make, what do you think of this question of the uh, uh, whether it's a, a, an amorphous movement without a specific set of, uh, of a list of issues uh, that could be translated into political impact. Do you see it having that kind of impact? Well, I think it will have tremendous impact. I mean, it would be extraordinary if, the, if people representing the 99 percent could actually come up with a succinct set of policy agendas within weeks of having this movement erupt. I think what they've done, which has been very wise, has been to say, we have a principle at work here. The principle at work here is that our economy needs to work for the 99%. Right now, the benefits of the so-called recovery, the benefits of all the increases in productivity, the benefits of our economy have all been going to the 1%. And that is taking our society and destroying it. It's destroying the prospects for the middle class. It's destroying hope for our kids who are graduating from college with tons of debt and no jobs that can pay enough to pay their, their debt and also pay their rent. So I think it's extraordinarily wise of them not to rush into trying to come up with a 10-point plan and instead essentially saying to the politicians, we need a society that works for the 99 percent. You tell us what policies are going to do that. Josh Barrow, what, what about this uh, question of the 99 uh, percent versus the 1 percent? Do you uh, address that? Well, first of all, the 99% uh, uh, of Americans live in households with incomes of $593,000 a year or less. 
So a lot of the bankers working on Wall Street are part of that 99% block as well. Um, and so I, I think that the conception of, of the movement is a little misplaced. It's not as though people near the top of the income distribution but not in the top 1% are doing poorly. They're certainly winners in the, in the economy of the last couple of decades too. And while the, uh, that, that may sound like a nitpick, the thing is that when we actually get to the policy stage, which has to happen at some point, we're going to talk about things like do we need higher taxes just on this small sliver of very wealthy people or do we need to look at, at higher taxes on a, a broader base of people and if, if you if you try to focus on just that one percent you won't be able to fix a lot of the country's fiscal problems for example uh, I also think that there's a little bit of presumptuousness about the the we are the 99 percent slogan obviously this movement does not have the support of 99 percent of Americans um, especially once you start getting down to policy specifics I think you know you can get a lot of agreement from the left and the right that people are upset about the way the financial sector has been treated over the last several years, uh, that banks have not seen the reforms that they needed to see to prevent the kind of the need for the kind of bailouts that we had to do in 2008. Um, but when you start getting into the specifics of what sort of banking sector we should have, what sort of tax code we should have, the 99% is going to splinter because people have different preferences about policy and they want different things out of the government. Well, Beverly Gage, what does the past tell us about what it takes to build up a movement that is, if not 99%, a majority of the country or to have real political clout? I think the questions that we're seeing start to emerge with Occupy Wall Street are questions that are sort of classic questions of social movements, particularly movements that have targeted uh, economic power, economic inequality, questions of what the relationship with the Democratic Party is going to be. Are they going to be somehow folded in, sort of a, a Tea Party style on the, on the left? Are they going to stand apart from party politics? What's the relationship with uh, specific legislation going to be? Is there actually going to be a legislative program? All of these these are not problems, they're just issues uh, that you find in uh, any sort of social movement and that we've seen in the past. I do think that one thing that's going to start to emerge, and we've seen little glimmers of it already, um, is that we've seen a lot of excitement, a lot of interest in this early stage of Occupy Wall Street. And one of the things that's going to become more and more of an issue is what happens um, as these become a more permanent feature of the landscape. Uh, what's the relationship with the police going to be like over the long term? How long are cities going to tolerate protests. We've seen some uh, very dramatic and in many cases tragic uh, outcomes in the past, things like the Bonus Army of 1932, uh, which was unemployed veterans kind of brutally driven out of Washington out of an encampment they had made then. So I think that those questions are going to start to come more to the fore. And I also think these questions about the role that the movement is going to have in relation to formal politics, to electoral politics, are they going to be part of it? Are they going to stand outside of it raising questions? All of those are, are what we're going to see in the next month or so. And Sarah Van Gelder, now, of course, we have this growing phenomenon of, of these uh, protests moving internationally. How important is that, do you think, and are, do you see a common thread here? Well, I, I do see a common thread. Let me just address the question of the, the agenda, because one of the things that hasn't happened in the U.S. is we've become so partisan, we've become so divided, that we haven't really had a conversation across class, across some um, party lines, across left and right. And one of the extraordinary things about what's happening in these occupation sites is that you see those kinds of conversations because whoever shows up gets to be part of it. So that could be a really interesting political shift in the U.S. political landscape. Internationally, I think there is a lot that this has in common with what's going on internationally because this, many of the problems are still this, are the same. We have the same situation in which large corporations are and, and a small group of people associated with them and large financial institutions are getting extraordinarily wealthy, while most people around the world are either seeing their standard of living stagnate or decline. So this notion resonates okay. enormously across, across the globe. And then we have social media to communicate those ideas. All right, uh, Josh Barrow, brief last word about the importance of the movement internationally. Well, I think that, uh, that we're seeing similar economic conditions around the world, so it's not surprising to see similar movements. I would note that I think the underlying economic conditions are actually significantly different in Europe. I think the root cause of many of the problems in Europe are the unsustainability of the Eurozone. And so effectively, I think it actually makes even less sense to focus on the financial sector in Europe. The big errors in Europe are pure government policy er errors that needs, need to be fixed by policymakers there, whereas in the U.S. there's more of a split between problems in the private sector and problems in the public sector. All right. Josh Barrow, Sarah Van Gelder, Beverly Gage, thank you all three very much. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you.